That's me. And who's this? Who recognizes this man? Any idea? Little hint, former US president. Oh, very good, very good. My students think Bill Clinton. No, bachelor students, older. Teddy Roosevelt, very correct. Known from A Night in the Museum, the movie, which is a very strange claim to fame for a US president, but that's how most people recognize him. Anyway, in 1912, he wanted to be re-elected as a US president, and back in those days, of course, they didn't have television, they didn't even have radio. If you wanted to be US president, you had to travel from city to city, and the only means of advertisement was a brochure. There we see it, with the image printed on it. Now, they just wanted to leave. They had printed three million brochures, and were ready to leave, and then somebody from the campaign team saw something terrible on it. Not the face, but the writing, Moffat Studios, Chicago. In other words, a certain Mr. Moffat from Chicago held the rights to that image, and they had totally forgotten to speak to him. So, they had a crisis meeting, and one of them said, hey, what are we going to do? Moffat has all the power. One said, hey, you know what? Let's just do it anyway. Just not in Chicago. Probably will have to pay a little fine, but the fine would have been $3 million, one dollar per unauthorized copy, and of course, a scandal. So they didn't do that. They came up with a different solution, which I will tell you about at the end of my talk. Power. That's the topic, negotiation power. I'll tell you a little story. I teach at Munich Business School, and across the street we have a little snack bar, and it's called, it's run by a guy called Giovanni, and the place is called Giovanni's Brotzeit Oase, a name that is impossible to translate because it's very Bavarian. So Giovanni stands there in front of his Brotzeit Oase, and he waves at me every morning. He's a very nice guy. He doesn't have any power over me, but the moment I approach him and say, hey, Giovanni, because he now sells pizza. He started selling pizza a couple of years ago, and it's really good. And if I said, hey, Giovanni, I need the recipe for your pizza because there's a pizza contest, all of a sudden, he has power over me. And the more important this competition is for me, the more power he has. So, Giovanni is the same. It's just me and my perception of Giovanni. Now, let's say... He has a son, call him Mario. Actually, I asked him before this talk, and he does have a son who's called Mario, <laughs> sometimes. And so he has a son called Mario, and for Mario, when Mario was five or six, Giovanni is the most powerful person on the planet because he tells him when to go to bed, what to eat, when to get up, everything. Now, as far as I know, Mario is about 20 years old, and Giovanni is not so powerful anymore. But Giovanni is the same. Now, if I see you, do I have any power over you? Not really. I could ruin your next 15 minutes or so if I were boring. Yes, certain power. Now, usually I have executives here for about two days, and I train them in negotiation. So they have paid already, and they you know, took two days off, so I have more power. But if you were students, I'd have even more power because I would grade you. But let's say there are 100 students sitting here for each and every student. The perception of my power is different. Probably one of them is very wealthy. He doesn't care. He's just sitting there. Somebody else probably is the only one from a very remote village who could study at a university. He walks to Munich Business School barefoot every morning uphill, probably the way back also uphill. And to him, I'm a godlike figure because I can really make the difference. He feels the urge to bring me refreshments and beverages during class. Hasn't happened yet, but hopefully. One day it should. So, to all these students sitting there, to all these people, they have a different perception of power. Now, let's imagine you meet the CEO, you see the CEO of your company in a restaurant, and you say, wow, powerful guy. And your friend is there saying, who's that fat guy? You say, well, it's the CEO. So? So, the power is not in him. It's in your perception. And that is the idea of power in a negotiation, that there is no power. There's only the perception of power, which is inside of you. And I'll show you a more extreme example of another gentleman, Jim Stockdale. Jim Stockdale was a US soldier during the Vietnam War. And he was captured by the Viet Cong, 
was put in a cell, and one night something happened. They rattled on his cell, or just opened it, it was war after all, very, very polite, and they said something you never want to hear when you're in a jail cell. They said, you face. And that is why you will play the starring role in a propaganda movie against the United States tomorrow morning. And he sat down in his stool. They closed the door. What power did this guy have? Well, he thought for a while. Then he took the stool and smashed his face. And he smashed it again and again until it was a bloody mess. Not a good image for a propaganda movie, which was never shot. He was actually imprisoned for over seven years. And he survived. And later he, he said that that night he cried in his cell. Not because of the pain, probably not only because of the pain, but he said that for the first time in all these years, he felt powerful and he regained his confidence. Well, he survived, he became a vice admiral and went into politics. A few years ago, a US senator was running, uh, going for a jog on Capitol Hill, wearing a nice watch, and somebody came with the international symbol. You can turn it off with the international symbol for power, a loaded gun. He said, give me your watch. And he said, wow, very nice, good to see you, because you know, I have cancer, I'm terminally ill, I wanted to commit suicide anyway, but then my wife wouldn't collect the life insurance, so please, just, you know, shoot. You do all of us a great favor, and you can just remove the watch easily, it's a little trick, but yeah, it would manage. So the robber was probably standing there, looking at the guy, looking at his gun, scratching his head, and just walked off. So the senator wasn't sick, was a little ruse, but I think it was quite uh, justified. So why am I telling you this? This story about James Stockdale, this story about the senator, because sometimes we face a loaded gun in a negotiation, we're scared. We think the other one is so much more powerful. He has all the more options. We are looking for a job, we're looking, we're at a bank, looking for a loan. So we see this loaded gun. And no matter where I am, because I worked a lot for car suppliers, they said, oh, we're facing Daimler and Audi. Then I worked for these big companies, and they didn't feel like gods. They said, we have to, you know, we need our supplies. We can't build cars. The unions think the big bosses run the factories, then I work for the big bosses in union contracts. Big bosses don't feel like big bosses. They think we don't have any power. We're employees ourselves. We have two-year contracts. The media is against us. The courts are against us. We are nothing. So that's what I'm trying to tell you, that we only see the other guy's loaded gun. And it's the same in every negotiation. So. Before you face a negotiation, we don't have much time, there's not a training, it's just a little talk, but you have to ask yourself, what is the worst thing that can happen? What's the worst thing this guy could do to you? He's going to kill you? Probably not. If you're not imprisoned in a Viet Cong cell, then probably it's not going to happen. If it's just a negotiation, what's the worst thing? You can always go home, watch Netflix, probably even chill if you're a little lucky, and it's okay, right? And especially if you live in Germany or in a Western country, nothing really bad is going to happen. You can always rely on welfare here. Yeah? And, you know, welfare pays Netflix 10 euros a month. That's fine. <laughs> That's the worst thing that can happen. Eat spaghetti all day. Okay. It's not that bad. So if you imagine this, and usually in a negotiation, it's much better. It's not even that bad. So there is no power in a negotiation. It's only the perception of power. So let's go back to the first um, gentleman, Teddy Roosevelt. What happened in that very instance? Well, the head of the election campaign came and said, Moffat doesn't have any power. You think he has the power, but he doesn't. We have all the power because he doesn't know about it. So he sent Moffat a telegram and said, hey, we are the campaign team of the old and new US president. We're planning to print three million brochures, and we're looking for a great photograph. Would be great advertisement for the photographer. How much would you be willing to pay us if we chose yours? You have eight hours 
because they had to leave. Almost immediately came the reply, oh, I've never done anything like that, but under these circumstances, I would be willing to pay you $250. I'm sure they could have negotiated it up with a certain negotiation advisor, but they were nice. And hey, Moffat got the advertisement of his life. Over 100 years later, we still talk about him. So that's what the thought I want to leave you with. In any negotiation, in any argument, there is no power. There is only the perception of power because you are the source of all power. I wish you great deals. Thank you very much.